Переходжу на російську мову, яка більше зрозуміла для нашого гостя. І я думаю, ми можемо розпочинати. Лекція сама буде вестися англійською мовою, але слайди для кращого розуміння будуть написані таким чином. Тому, здравствуйте, Джейсон. Радий вас вітати. Прошу. So, do you all understand English? I'll start with that. Do you all actually understand what I'm saying? Yes? Yeah. Because this is easy, it gets complicated later. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, then we will begin. So, <clears throat> the first slide is fine. So, I'll just say who I am in brief, go through it. I studied in the United States and here in the former Soviet States. I keep going, political science. I have done a lot of academic publications, including a lot here in Ukraine. Uh, and my main area of study is something called character assassination. Character assassination is attacks on the reputation of somebody. So it's why that happens and how that happens and what impact that has on not only that person but or in the society or the political campaign in which they're involved. Um, I do political consulting. I've done it now in almost all the continents. Uh, Latin America, the US, Europe, Africa and the former Soviet states. Here in Ukraine, thank you both. Here in Ukraine, I mostly am though asked to give commentary about international relations, that is, international, international affairs. And so that's what I normally keep going. That's what I normally am here commenting on, so keep going. And these articles I write for, mostly it's for Abuzrato, Gordon, y Correspondent. Keep going. So, back to my theory of how we should understand international relations, or sorry, political science, sociology, same thing, in the perspective of somebody who works in the field and doesn't just study. Is the example I always give is Indiana Jones. So Indiana Jones, if you remember the movie, has two aspects to him. Indiana Jones is a professor of archaeology, uh, another social science discipline. And though he is an academic, he also applies the knowledge he has. It's not left to just writing articles and doing research and attending conferences, uh, but it is rather how do you apply this to real life? How is it that I take this knowledge that I have and apply it to real life settings and real life circumstances of study? This one. So, next. My work, so I'll tell you briefly the sort of work I've had before and which countries that was in. So I've done work in a lot of countries around the world. This year I've lived mostly in South America actually, so I've not been to Kiev much this year at all. Um, I just got here last week, but I was doing work in the former Soviet states, in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Lithuania, Russia, and Ukraine. I think that's all. Uh, and Georgia. And Georgia. And Georgia. Yes, Georgia. So this work has been a lot of different things, but this work has allowed me to see several different things. The things it allows you to see is one, if you have the theory of how something works, just so campaigns and elections, or social research, the theory is one thing, but the application of it does vary by where you are. At the same time, you notice that there's a lot of things that work all the time, everywhere. And so you can distinguish what is something that is specific to, as a science, we can say is true. It will always work all the time. But what are the local specifics or local uh, uh, tendencies that change how we understand this and change how we apply our approach in those countries or regions? So in the course of my work, I've gotten thrown out of three countries, which include Russia, Uzbekistan, and Belarus. In the case of Russia and Belarus, it was, it was 10 years ago, I was working with Boris Nemtsov, who was an opposition politician in Russia, and the Russians didn't like that very much, so they made me leave their country. Uh, in the case of Uzbekistan, it was I got arrested, uh, actually in Uzbekistan. So after a little bit of time in the intelligence service jail for oh, less than a week, I was deported back to Kyrgyzstan, where I was working. Next one. In the course of that, though, my time in Kyrgyzstan, I was working with U.S. finance programs to support democratic opposition to the dictatorship. In the period of time, up until April 7th, 2010, they had a dictator named uh, Kermanbek Bakiev. Kermanbek Bakiev was the Russian-supported leader of the country who uh, eventually had to flee the country due to the outbreak of civil uh, disturbances and uh, rioting. Ultimately, it's just rioting. And it forced him to leave the country. Next slide. Immediately following that, there was a program of ethnic Uzbeks in the country, which are a minority. I think it's about 20%. I can't remember anymore of the population. But the ethnic Kyrgyz started killing all the ethnic Uzbeks. Following this, I was able to work with the new government as they created a new constitution. So as a consultant to the writing of the national constitution of the Kyrgyz Republic. 
and worked with them in that effort. Uh, that document is still in use today. They still use that constitution. And I was advising there with the first female president of the, in Central Asia, who was Rosa Atambayeva, and with the government there that was trying to create a sort of European, though it's Asian, it's not European, uh, European idea of what is a modern democracy. I said, yeah. So in the course of the people that I've worked with, a lot of it's turned out badly, but some of it's turned out well. And you see there's a well, sports himself in the bottom left and the top right. In the top left is a guy who I worked with, uh, who was a Kazakh opposition person, who was in prison actually when I met him. The first time I met him was visiting him in trial, and he got freed from prison actually, uh, and he became a minister, but now he's back to being an opposition politician. The guy in the middle is Oleg Kozlovsky, who's an opposition politician in Russia, uh, with who I was in touch, and who's been arrested an incredible number of times. And obviously there's Navalny on the bottom right. Uh, this upcoming Friday, I go to Lithuania to again work with the Russian opposition, where I'm active with a guy named Gary Kasparov, who's the chess player. So I work with him and his opposition movement, and uh, he's invited me to come to Vilnius to assist them. So, keep going. Uh, the work, trust me, this part of my biography will go through really fast. Um, so I ran a lot of campaigns in the United States before this all happened. I worked in Republican politics for a number of years. I worked for Senator John McCain, and I worked for Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, and in the course of work for Senator Ted Cruz, I was working for Cambridge Analytica, which you've probably heard of now. So, there we get to Cambridge Analytica. Um, so when I worked with Cambridge Analytica, we had an interesting task in that Senator Cruz, in that period of time, this was 2015-2016, the Republican primaries, you know the primaries, what that is, right? The parties choose the leader, so, or their candidate. So there were 16 candidates, of which our friend here, Ted Cruz, was 15 out of 16, so he's at the very bottom. Uh, but then there was also Donald Trump, who I think was in eighth place, and he ended up first. What did Donald Trump have in common with Ted Cruz? Is they both used Cambridge Analytica. They both used big data. Um, in the course, number nine, sorry, I was wrong, number nine. So next one. So we see the map, we see the electoral map. The US is very strange how we do our elections, it's true. But that's what it looked like. Next one. And what we had for the Cambridge Analytica team was a group of 12 guys who were astrophysicists. And nearly all of them were from Cambridge, either from the UK, but a large number of them were from Cambridge. Uh, some of them were not actually astrophysicists, they're just physicists, but they're all higher level mathematicians. Uh, and the reason that they came from Cambridge at a disproportionately high number was simply the ability to find people with that level of mathematical ability, like their minds are so genius, is very hard to find. And you need people that are absolutely brilliant. And the world produces very few people that are so brilliant. And they happen to be centered in places like Harvard or Cambridge or MIT. So that's where we found them. And they worked on our team. This one. And what they would do is to help us with the micro-targeting. The micro-targeting of ads is, well, I mean, you can read the text, but you see that the micro-targeting of ads is to make sure that we are able to have a message that is specific to people so that they understand it and that they're able to fully comprehend what is happening. That they understand the message not as a general message for the general population, but to them on a very personal level, on a specific level. Because the most effective way to convince somebody is if you speak to them one-on-one -on -one and not as a group. If I speak to you about the subject that I'm talking about right now, one-on-one, -on -one, you would understand it much better than if I speak to all of you at one time. Because you can interact with me. And a campaign, a modern campaign, wants interaction. It's not about telling you to do something. It's about you explaining to the campaign what you want, the campaign tells you what they think, and sharing an idea so that you're persuaded to vote for the candidate. Next one. So the way that works is this. Taking outside factors, we are able to determine <coughs> who someone votes for, or what is likely to persuade someone to vote. In the case of Cambridge Analytica, what the way it looked at is this. For every voter in the country, the US has a population of about 330 million people. So, for those 330 million people, obviously about half of them are not voters. Actually, more than half are not voters. So you only have to have, let's imagine, 150 million of those people that you have to really collect information about. But for those people, those voters, the registered voters, uh, we had a ton of information up to 5,000 points of data for each one. But what's the point of data? Well, obviously we had their phone number, or we had their cell phone number, or we had their you know, bank account number, we had their work, we had their tax history, we knew how many times they'd been arrested, which university they finished, how much <coughs> income they had, where their wife worked, which school their kids went to, what education level they had attained, 
what type of car they had, who they bought it from, which social networking sites they used. We had a lot of data about their personal background. Based upon this huge mass of data, based upon this huge mass of data, it allows us to do experiments, mathematical experiments. Does this make sense so far? Do you follow me so far what I'm saying? Yes or no? Yes? Really yes? It's always the girls that say yes, and the guys just sit here and I can never talk to them. <laughs> um, okay, so we, based upon this huge mass of data, now we're getting to the big data part. You have this mass of data. We know this guy's entire financial history, his economic history, uh, his personal relationship history, his housing, where he lives, how he gets to work, where he works, what he does. Uh, but based upon this data, we then have a lot that, if, you know how a poll works, right? You know how a political poll is, sorts of pros, right? Yeah. You know, it's, you do, it's an hour thing, you have a sample size, you ask a bunch of people questions. And based upon that, we can understand what the larger population thinks. It's not the poll is specifically what you think, but it'll say girls from the age of 18 to 25 that live in Kiev are 45% more likely to like this than girls that are 18 to 24 who live in Kherson. Right? It just shows you statistical probability of some relationship. It's not 100%, but it's statistical probability. Now, as you know with a poll, the more people you ask a question of, instead of 2,000 people that you have as respondents, we had 150,000 people as respondents. So the degree that this was very precise was incredible. It was incredibly precise. And it was no longer generic, like girls 18 to 24 in Kiev. It was then 18-year-old girls in Kiev who have this level of education, whose parents do this, who have this sort of economic background, who grew up in this area, who have this type of car, that have this sort of a husband, that have this one child, who have, based upon all this, they are this percentage more likely to do this than to do that. So we were able to break it down to an incredibly micro, micro, micro level. But it wasn't just girls at the age level. It then became also the spending habits. So girls with all those attributes, plus the fact that they drink more beer than wine, plus the fact that they're likely to save less than 20% of their income, or they have debts that are more than 10% of their income, based upon all these different factors, you say, that person is probably with a high degree of certitude, statistical certitude, we could say he's like, she is likely to be a potential voter for us. And she is likely to be most interested in the issues of, say, taxes and roads, are the biggest issues, most interesting issues for her in, camp in the campaign. So for that person, we would have messaging that we specifically sent to them and explained to them so that they would understand what our position were on taxes and roads, because that person we know is interesting. But we know that, for instance, her mother, whom she lives with, does not care about taxes and roads. We know that based on all the statistics we have, her mother's most interested in schools, and income. Okay, so her message is about school and income. Makes sense so far? Yes? Yeah. Okay, so now we'll get specific. So, we have this overall thing. And in the general population, that was like the base knowledge. Now I can be specific. So, once again, we have the United States population. And we really we recognize a couple things. We recognize that these people we don't need. Because these people, remember, are the ones who are going to be less than 18 years old, the ones who are going to be non-voters, which is a huge percent of the population, they simply don't vote. And we, these are also people who may be moved out of the country, right? So they don't live there, they're not gonna vote in the elections. It's statistically improbable, at least. So these people, every dollar we spend on them is a wasted dollar. So let's imagine our campaign budget was $100. If you realize that more than half the people in the population don't vote, more than half, if you were to do something like campaigns here in Ukraine, and stand there in the street and just give them Mistovki, the statistical probability that you're gonna hit somebody who's a voter is low. Because even this other half of the population that does vote, it's also divided. Because in the US population, about half of these people you don't need. Why? These are people that with a high degree of certitude they're gonna vote Democrat, as are for the Republicans. This group here is the one that you want. These are the ones that there's a statistical probability that we can convince them to vote Republican or will vote Republican. So in the end, out of the whole US population, it's not gonna be 330 million people that you would have to give a piece of paper to in the street. It's in fact much smaller. It could only be, say, 50 million people. So if you're able to save more than six times more money and just hit those, let's say that one group of people, that target audience, and you're able to hit them six times, give them six times information, rather than just one time, because you've saved money, you're not wasting on these people, you're not wasting on these people. You give it to them six times information, the probability that you will persuade them is much, much, much higher. 
Make sense? Yes. Okay, so it's very simple. But it's more interesting than that. So, and the reason I say it's more interesting is this. Voters are typically classified into seven sections. This is category zero, because these people don't vote. There's category seven. There's category six. There's five, four, three, two, one. And who are these people? These people here are 100%, they always vote an election, and they always vote Republican. It's called hard R, hard Republican. 100% guaranteed they will vote for us. 100% they will come on election day. So once again, to spend money on these people, bad investment. Because actually, this is Dems, it's reverse, sorry. So it's now a D, this is the R. Um, so these guys, we know that they will vote for us. Mm -hmm. They just need to be reminded, come on election day, they've already been persuaded. We don't need to persuade them in the long run. They always vote for us. But on the other extreme over here, we have Democrats. And these Democrats, the ones, are 100% Democrat voters. They'll never vote for us. No matter what we do to persuade them, they actually hate us. They actually will always vote Democrat. Doesn't make sense to spend money on those people either, right? And these people are pretty soft Democrats. These people are like 80% or more uh, Democrat. But sometimes they forget to vote, or sometimes they uh, have voted for a Republican in the past, but infrequently. We could spend money on them. We could try to persuade them, but there's a cost to that. The fact is, the campaign always has a limit of time and money. It's two factors always under the campaign, time and money. And there's a limit of time and money. So if I can invest the money here, yes, but it makes more sense that I invest the money here, this guy who votes 80% of the time Republican, to persuade him. Because the ability to persuade him is much faster than a guy who's 80% already opposed to our ideas then this guy is 80% with us. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so then you have the ones who are in the middle, the soft. This guy is someone who's called lean Democrat, this one's leans Republican. He's mostly on our side, he's you know, 60% there, and this one's 60% Democrat side, but they're persuadable. They actually have voted, you know, let's say in the last 10 elections, they voted six or seven times Democrat, but they voted three or four times Republican. Mm -hmm. It's more likely to persuade them because they're open-minded, than somebody who's completely dedicated to the other party. So the actual result is that a political campaign in every country that uses data science, the campaign is focused on these people. These people are probably, it, it obviously varies by country, but let's say it's between five to 10% of the population. It's realistic in the US, 7%. But let's say it's five to 10% of the population. Now, imagine that. This changes everything. Because this means if we have identified who these people are out of a population of 330 million people, all of a sudden, we've gone from doing 330 million people receiving our advertisements to just this, say, 10%. 33 million people receiving these advertisements. Think how much more effective that is, what the savings are. And if you are then, it's, right, it's a lot cheaper, 10 times cheaper. If it's 10 times cheaper, I can go 10 times to these people's house where they just go one time to their house. Is a huge amount of money I was able to save, which then allows me to contact them more times with greater frequency. And the more frequency that there is, the more it's likely to persuade someone to vote for you. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, we would identify this. But the way that we identify this is this. We would have, so we would have in the population, different groups of people and they have different interests. And that's where data science becomes interesting. So it identifies these people, these fours and fives, and these six and sevens. And the strategy of how we deal with them is different. For instance, as I said to you, somebody who's a zero, you just don't waste money on. And the guy just doesn't vote, he doesn't care, he's never cared, he's 60 years old, he's never voted in his life. Statistically, very unlikely he's gonna go on election day. And the cost to persuade him to vote after 40 years of not voting is very expensive, he just doesn't care. But the ones who are here, we have to understand they have different motivations for why they vote for whom they vote for. So, once again, I said there's the U.S. electorate, and there are different issues that they care about. You know, these people care about transportation. These people really care about roads. These people care about the pensions. These people care about the military. These people care about guns, uh, firearms, guns. These people care about schools. There's different issues that people care about. Now, if you're a voter, as you just as a voter, are looking at this, you think like, well, if I really care about jobs for people who have degrees in sociology, 
because I'm really like interested in that. Jobs for sociologists. There's a very limited number of people in Ukraine who care about that. It's an extremely limited number. But if a candidate were to come to you and say, I have a plan specifically for sociologists to get better jobs when they get out of college that pays them like Europeans can pay for this. Your interest level in this message would be like this. If you were just to receive a message about we're going to build roads, I better be much less interesting for you and less likely to influence who you'd vote for in the election. So a generic message about roads or teachers or taxes, less likely to influence you. Jobs for sociologists, high degree to influence you. So when we would go to somebody's house, we would understand what their issue was. And it was broken down into hundreds and hundreds of different categories. And for some people, it would be, you know, jobs for sociologists. And they would get messaging from us. And actually, despite what it says online, it wasn't much about social media. The vast majority of it was in-person interaction. The vast majority of how this was effective was that we had an iPhone, and actually Samsung as well, uh, Android. We had an app. This app would allow you to come up to somebody's house. And you stand there, and it's 123 Main Street. And it knows that because of your location. It says, are you at 123 or 125 Main Street? So 123, click. So you knock on the door, and two people, uh, one person comes. And it says, is it Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith? You click Mr. Smith. Oh, prepare a message for Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, for us, jobs for sociologists are incredibly important. And we specifically think they're underemployed and underpaid. We have a plan to hire them to do research, whatever. Clear message for Mr. Smith. However, if Mrs. Smith were to answer the door, she might have a completely different message. Mrs. Smith, in this election, for us, the building of new roads is the most important thing. Would you not agree that we must build more roads faster? Because Mrs. Smith, that is the issue that will motivate her to vote the election. Not the same as Mr. Smith. They have different interests. But equally, when they would go on their cell phones and go on Google, which Google ads, by the way, work on like every website, but if they use anything that is on Google, or if they use Facebook, they would see ads that were from us that were specifically on that issue, whether it's jobs for sociologists or it's roads. Whatever their issue was, they would see the ad from us. So that makes sense, right? But here's where it gets more interesting. We did, because we did do the survey of 150,000 people, we did a psychological profile called Myers-Briggs. And Myers-Briggs is Carl Jung. This, you know who Jung is, right? This Jung. Hello, is that guy? Jung. And he was, so he's, you know, theory of personalities, there's 16 of them, they're all different. So we did that sort of test on the <laughs> sizable percentage of the population in the US. So we knew the personality types of these people. So not only did we know what their interests were, and we knew what their entire financial background was or anything else, we would also know their personality type. So if you had jobs for sociologists, and let's imagine the motivation for jobs for sociologists differs. For instance, when we say jobs for sociologists, you could be someone who's getting out of college and you need the job. <coughs> or you could be a business that can't tolerate a good sociologist. So when you say jobs for sociologists, your understanding of what that means is completely different than what you ever said. He's saying there's not quality sociologists in our country. So he needs it for jobs. And someone else here, let me just take an example, could say jobs for sociologists. I mean this in the sense that I don't think that the quality of academic and research in Ukraine is like it was in the Soviet Union. We need to change it. So his is just general historic. I think it's a good thing. He's not personally connected to this. But it's the most important thing for him in the election. So these people have different motivations, like taxes. When I say taxes, well, one person could feel that taxes are wasted. Somebody else could think we have too many taxes, just in general. Somebody else would think that we need taxes to be reduced. Somebody else thinks that business taxes need to be reduced, not income taxes. Somebody else thinks that taxes at the airport are too much. Somebody else says taxes means a sales tax. But which tax? Just saying taxes doesn't mean anything. But if you say sales tax to this person, and you say to that person employment taxes, and to that person business taxes, it's the message that matters most to them. But because we did sociological research on their personality types, the psychographic research as they call it, we were able to break down each one of these personality types. So then for each group, we'd have multiple different messages. So young people who don't have a child, their degrees in sociology, have different personality types, obviously. There's someone who's an extrovert. There's a guy who's an introvert. There's a guy who has paranoid personality. And there's all these different personality types. So, 
for the paranoid, uh, we'll start with extrovert. So for extrovert, the example would be this, is that the ads he would see, like when we sent it to you in the mail at your house, the ads for him would be groups of people working together on our products and they're getting better salary and it's a message about how the salaries will improve and improve their lives. And it's people interacting because he likes people interacting. Being unemployed means he's not interacting with people, which is a social negative for him. But in his perception of what this is, the jobs for sociologists equals not only jobs, but more friends. And if you have this, you'll be able to impact society positively. He likes to think that this is something he's doing. For the introvert, it could be completely different. For the introvert, it could be a message that, listen, you're very smart, you've done a good job, but you know, you're underappreciated. And it shows a guy working by himself at a desk doing research because he doesn't want to interact with other people. That doesn't make him happy. A job at a desk doing sociological research or regression analysis is perfect. That makes him happy. And that's what he wants to do. For the guy who's paranoid, say, the jobs are getting worse and worse. Soon there'll be no jobs for sociologists. Unless we immediately change what we're doing, you have to vote for this candidate. For every personality type, we'd have a message that is most likely to be persuasive to them on the individual level, not just in the type of message, but on the psychological profile that they have. Make sense so far? Any questions so far? No. No? Uh, it works only for promotion of the position of your body, or it can also be used to undermine the position of the, your opponent. Absolutely, you can undermine your opponent. <laughs> How that works? Maybe there is some difference. In sure, sure. I'll, I'll explain that. Sure, that's a really good question. Um, so, hey, and I'll explain exactly that. So let's imagine you have this exact same thing. But instead of being for voters that are voters, the six and sevens, we're trying to understand what their motivation is. We have this now for the ones and the twos, the ones who are opposed to us. So in a campaign, remember the bottom line is to have the most votes. The most votes is calculated by having more than the other people in the competition. It's not a specific number, it's more than the others. So if you can push down the rating of your opponent, it means the, the number of votes that he receives, it means the number of votes that you received is more. Make sense? So if you both have 100, but all of a sudden two more of your friends came to vote and two or more of his friends stayed at home, you win the election. And the way that this works is two types. There is something called voter suppression, which is actively pushing for your opponents to not vote on election day. And the way that could be is something like, you know, your candidate, the opponent, Mr. X. Mr. X has a plan that is absolutely terrible for the roads. The roads will get worse and worse. Haven't you seen what he said? Haven't you seen that he's gonna increase taxes to do for this? And you think, well, I'm not gonna vote for him. I'm not gonna vote for anyone. I'll just stay at home on election day. Suppression. The second way of doing it is called voter runoff. Where you say, listen, you have Mr. X. He's, we know he's the ideal candidate. We know this person's never gonna vote for us. We know they hate us. They absolutely hate us, they'll never vote for us. So we can't persuade them. And we can't persuade them to stay home because they always voted in elections. At the same time, we could say, you know that Mrs. Y has a position that's really, really good on this issue? Like, she's gonna build the really best roads. And you could target them with positive information about a different candidate. So if we look at it this way, let's imagine she, we have a rating of you know, 49% in the elections, 49% of people are going to vote for us. This person has 49%. This person has 1%. The rest don't know. Where's the other one? There we go. 1%. If we can force 5% five of, of those voters to vote for Ms. Y and waste their vote, it guarantees the election for us, right? So if we just suppress them, so they vote for this candidate instead of for the other candidate, that works exactly in our favor. That is politically victorious for us. So we must make sure that our targeting of the voters is done to either encourage them to vote, as I said, seven categories, encourage them to remember to vote, remember to vote, and here's persuasive reasons why you should do that. Just general persuasion, and once they, it's clear that they are our voters, they're convinced, then they move into the category of just reminding the vote on election day. And then you have the other categories of force them to stay home or get them to vote for another candidate. Make sense? So far so good? Yes. Okay. So, we continue. May I ask another question? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, uh, as I see, it's a good instrument to write a proper message to proper people, but uh, are these messages related to the real aims of politicians or uh, real political programs of parties and so on. 
I mean, yeah, it's it's not a myth. It's it's what it is though is, I mean, it's a liberal interpretation of their plans. Uh, what 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 I mean is that if, for instance, I mean, if you watch American political ads. The opponent, whoever the opponent is, ever in history, it always starts with like, is the most radical conservative or most radical leftist. It's always like one of two categories, and it always repeats this thing. Because what's the most radical? It's, well, it's quite subjective. What is the most radical? I mean, the most radical, like Hillary Clinton is a communist. I really remember that ad. Like, she's really not a communist. I mean, she is, she's a leftist. She is not Che Guevara. Um, she's very far from that. But if you can create this narrative that she's the most of this, the most extreme, which is traditional by the way, character association, like always happens. The most extreme on any position, nobody likes extremists. Extremists are not generally popular. Um, people want someone who's like normal. So if you can paint the picture that they're too extreme, it's very much to your benefit. So on all their issues, whatever it is, you can tell the truth, but how you choose to qualify this and what adjectives you use it's quite subjective. Well, one person uses a radical, another person might not. But it's not just that. I mean, that's like sort of cheap. It's also the fact that you can look at different things, especially in the US, because so many of our politicians have been in office for so long. Uh, they have voting records that are very, very long. And so when you look at their voting record over 20 years, the probability that they voted for laws that have a secondary impact, like the law's objective was to improve schools. The secondary impact was that it created a huge deficit. Look, she just cannot stop stealing your money in taxes, and then she wasted it. Look at the deficit she created here. Well, it wasn't her intent, but there's a secondary impact from 15 years ago. But you could cite that as an example that the person's a radical, and they're trying to destroy the economy. Any, yes? Uh, I was wondering, uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more about the Trump it actually works in a multi-typal political system because uh, it's cool if you have just Democrats and uh, just two parties and uh, we had uh, 44 candidates for president this year and it's a not big data, it's a huge data and we have uh, absolutely, I mean, you have the phenomenon of um, a loyal voter that my grandfather voted for Democrats, me who voted for Democrats, my children who will vote for Democrats. And we have a voter who is absolutely lost in this system and if one person could actually vote one election for this president, uh, another election for now. So there's two, there's two factors, three factors. Is one is that we also have like 40 candidates in our election for president. Um, so it works everywhere. But I'll, and I'll use Ukrainian examples, like I'll finish explaining this and I'll use Ukrainian examples. So that's one. Secondly, is that no voter really is ever undecided. And I completely reject that idea. Because the fact is, when they say I'm undecided, nobody's ever sitting there saying, I don't know, should I vote for Yanukovych or do I like the Yanukovych model? If you voted for Yanukovych, you vote for Oppo Bloc and you voted for all the other Eastern Ukraine senator parties, the probability of vote for Svoboda is extremely low. There's this very low statistical probability. That's possible. Everything's possible. But statistical probability, very low. The probability of vote for Russian-speaking party, extremely high. It's just a matter of determining which one. And that's why you'd be a six on this thing. You're already there. You're definitely going to go that way. But which one of those ways, hmm, hard to say. It has to be determined. So people do have very clear lines that they follow. People do switch. People do change. Very unlikely that it's strong changes. Very likely it's changes of minor changes, of course, here and here. It's not going this way. Um, so that's the second. The third is that when we look at voters and their tendencies, we notice that voters are generally motivated by self-interest above anything else, which is incredibly important because in Ukraine, when you read polling or you watch TV here even more, uh, people have, there's no comprehension in the media of Ukraine of how polling works. I mean, that's abundantly obvious because if you look at the populism here, which is the cheapest form of populism, because it's something that's just an emotional thing right now, you look at voters and say, will that motivate you to vote for them because they did this or did that? It doesn't motivate voters. They might show that you know 85% of people support this, but it doesn't motivate one voter because it doesn't touch them on a level that's personally interesting to them. That's a personal necessity for them. Make sense? So what I mean is, look at look at the RADA and just look what they do. It's always attempts to just plead to the population that they're a patriot or something. 
But the population isn't looking for that right now. The population is saying, the economy is terrible, my quality of life sucks, who's going to improve it? And they want to concrete something. They want hope. So, in the Ukrainian elections, what would this mean? In the Ukrainian elections, I think we could break down like this. And it's been a while since I gave this presentation in Ukraine, so I don't remember numbers well. But, say Ukraine. And so, out of this Ukraine, we have various groups of people. And we'll say these people here, we'll do this one. So these people here are the ones who don't vote. Remember, waste your money. The ones who have migrated outside the country, there's very low number of migrants vote. Migrated outside the country are dead, but are still on the list for the election day. The people who just don't vote in elections. A huge number here. But then within the population that's left, just to be like very, uh, let's see, general, people do have preferences here. And this actually last election was obviously a huge change in this. And there's a lot of reasons that looked at Temple Wysinski won, because it was like pretty obvious he would win even before he ran. <laughs> Um, because the polling in Ukraine had showed massive discontent. Massive discontent. All the politicians were hated. And you look at the negative ratings exceeding 70%. Yulia Tymoshenko in the summer of 2018 had 73% negative. 73% negative and people were saying she's probably going to be the president. She's probably going to be the president. There was no way she could become president. And if she did, she'd have a highly unstable nation. It'd be impossible to manage the country with 73% negative. But either way, her negatives leading to elections where people said she's about to become president, sorry, her positives, her positives, were, and then Petro Poroshenko's, it's like a positive part of Poroshenko. His negatives were 75%. Yanukovych, when he left the country, had better ratings than he did. And he was the most likely person to win election. So think how tremendously unpopular he was. And as it was obvious then, and you look at the polling, why are people this way? I'm dissatisfied with the politicians. I hate the Rada, I hate the presidency, I hate the courts. Nothing they're happy with. They want an outsider. They wanted somebody, anyone, anyone. It could have been Vakar Chuk, but he wasted it. He could have filled that gap, filled his vacuum, and taken those votes. Now they're there. Going back to this. So we look at these voters, and historically, the way it worked in Ukraine, and this is different than this last election, yes, but historically, the way it worked in Ukraine was this. Is that, and we look at the elections from 2014 as an example. So you have voters here who are definitely going to vote for Yulia Tymoshenko. I love her. The other ones here who are definitely going to vote for Yashko. They love her. And everyone always laughs when I say Yashko. <laughs> and you have the ones here who think Misha Sakashvili is really wonderful. You have the ones who are, I actually use different colors. So you have ones who really think that Petro Poroshenko was wonderful. You have the ones that think that uh, Apple Block was just wonderful. You have the ones who are really excited about Robbie Norwich. But you have various candidates, right? So you're going through various candidates over here. Who Krop and formerly did. Um, so you look at all these different things. You say, okay, so these are the ones that have preferences. These people voted in the past for this, and they've stated they have a strong interest in voting again for these people. Or they've done it for several times in an election, and are not completely dissatisfied, high probability they'll vote again for these candidates. Now, however pro possible, not probable, but rather possible, it is for Yulia Tymoshenko, when she's looking at the election, and she's trying to figure out how to win, Yulia says, well, you know, where do I get votes from? Well, she has her specific target demographic. Her target demographic is this. That target, target demographic it's going to share something in common with Apple Block. It's going to be like this. Not a lot of overlap, ultimately, in voters. With Misha Saakashvili, it might be like this, before he started himself. When you have Professor Poroshenko, it might be like this. They all have overlap. The game is how do you convince this small group to go with you and not to go with your opponent, right? Does it make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. You're trying to persuade the same group of people, but the messaging is different. Like these people, it's a question on either one, Professor Poroshenko, I'm with you. It's one of the two. I'm definitely not going up a block. Not a question. I'm definitely going with these two. So though it is possible in an election that someone like Apple Block would get somebody who is a former Svoboda voter, their profile as a voter is completely different. I and mean, it's really very, very different. 
the probability low, so the amount of money you would invest if you're just targeting some vulnerable voters would be incredible for every one of the few votes you would get. It's better targeting people who have formerly been voting for party of regions. So if they always voted for party of regions and like them, much higher probability they'll like uh, the, the upper block. And so Yulia Timoshenko, in the last elections, parliamentary in 2014, had, I don't remember the number well, it's like 865,000 votes. Keep in mind, the population of Ukraine is like, what, 43 million? It means Yulia had less than 2%, no, 45, let's say 45. She had less than 2% of the total number of Ukrainians voted for her. It's like 1.8%. Now, out of voters, she had obviously 5.7% voted for her. But of total Ukrainians, 98% did not vote for Black Machina. Inversely, right? 98% did not. So think how incredibly ineffective it is when they have all these Polapki and they're standing there handing out these things, how completely ineffective that is. 98% of those people are not going to vote for you. Her actual televised auditoria might, or target, might be, five, let's say, 5% five of the population is really open to her. The total population, not voters, mm -hmm. might be open to her. So if she were to just target that 5%, then she would understand that uh, using social media, or using uh, big data, sorry, that these people are all voting for her, that's the ULA people. From the last joke, these voters might be persuaded her. These people are open to her. From Isha Sakashvili, these voters are open to her. From Apple Block, just those voters are open to her. Because I'm not doing it to all of them. Not all Russian speaking people, not all the people in Kharkov. I'm doing just the ones who might vote for me. From here, I'm just taking these voters. From here, I'm just taking these voters. From here, I'm just taking these voters. Instead of targeting the entire population, I'm just targeting the voters in each one of the other parties that are likely to be converted and to vote for me. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So her general expenditures, when you look at her campaign on a national level, how effective is this? It was so effective that Cambridge Analytica, when I worked at least, Cambridge Analytica on the Cruise campaign spent millions and millions, I think it was seven or eight, nine million dollars, I don't remember the number now. We spent over it. At the same time, we made for the campaign like $25 million. So it was profitable to have Cambridge Analytica work for your campaign. Why? Obviously, imagine it's the United States. These were identifying who can give you money and how much money they can give you. So if this is a guy who we know his top issue is jobs for sociologists and he doesn't have a job, but we think based upon his spending habits, he can afford to give us a $10 donation. He would see a thing about, you know, contribute to help jobs for sociologists. Make like a $10 donation. But for a rich guy who's really interested in jobs for sociologists, say, could you make a $2,700 donation? And it would be targeting a way that would make it most likely he would donate money to the campaign. So this was then making a profit for the campaign. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah, please. Uh, you told that <coughs> the Washington uh, don't like the really the radicals, but the Hillary Clinton almost told the primaries to the Bernie Sanders and uh, it's not a right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he called them all uh, marginalized uh, politicians. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, is, it in, is it some inconsistent maybe? No, I don't think so. And I, here's the reason I don't think so. It's because radical actually has a term. Radical is mean, right? So let's we'll think about it this way. You know, throw this out. So, if, if we did a somewhat traditional political spectrum, which is, I agree, not the way you do political spectrums anymore, but we just say left, right, right? Liberal, uh, that is closer to socialism, right? Closer towards libertarianism. If we have this normal one, US politicians are all living here. Bernie Sanders is like here. Donald Trump's here. Hillary Clinton's here. If we look at normal, like, for instance, if look at any European political party, the most conservative European political party, <coughs> David Cameron. Of the party's profile, they're here. They're completely further to the left than we are. We're really far the other direction. And it's unusual. It's strange. And it's just the way the country works. 
and Americans like that for whatever reason. Um, so we're over sort of an extreme of how European politicians <coughs> would perceive this. Also, we have to understand that Bernie Sanders was actually an excellent indicator of Donald Trump. Why? Because both of them are saying we have to destroy the system. The entire system of governance is broken and needs to be destroyed. That's what exactly their messages were. One appeals to the left, one appeals to the right. But the actual message is we must destroy the system that's making people poor. Mm -hmm. Their solution to that is completely different. Mm -hmm. But their perception, their perception of the problem is the same. The system itself is broken. So it's voting against, it's like the Zelensky vote, it's voting against really them for voting for. It's I'm voting for you to go destroy what is there. All right, any other questions? Yep. Uh, it might be that advancing this uh, open-minded part of voters is not enough to win elections. For example, Julia Tymoshenko have only 5% of flexible voters, but the gap between the four and the next candidate is bigger than 5%. What should be done with it's, well, I mean, at the end it was, but <coughs> if you look at the elections in Ukraine, which is sort of funny, because it's always, if you look at polling in Ukraine in your elections, it's always the same. Look at like two years ago, everyone said Sadovi is going to become the president. Misha Sakshula become the prime minister. Nadi Savchenko will probably become the next president. Look at all the polling where everybody had 75% positives and where they are today. They're all less than 4%. The numbers wildly fluctuate in Ukraine. Wild, and the problem was that <coughs> as the population is generally opposed to like everybody, you can win over voters because they hate everybody else so much. Your ability to target them is actually not that difficult. You have voters. You realize, let's just say as a rule, you have a pro-European party, Ukrainian-speaking party, NATO-friendly party. You have to understand that those voters that you have in Ukraine, that's half the voters that feel this way or more at this point, those people, the, vet, the majority of voters in Ukraine are highly dissatisfied and they're unhappy. Right now they're not, like at this exact moment, give it a year, they'll be the same way as Zelensky. And when they reach that point with Zelensky, then your party can expand. There's a number of people who are disenfranchised and feel that they were cheated and that they hope for more and they hope that things would change, but they didn't change, will be incredibly high. At that point, you can expand and get more votes. Yulia is in a different problem. Yulia's problem is that her negatives are so incredibly high. And her are actually, but she does have a stable base. Yulia's base doesn't shift much. I mean, her fundamental base is the same now as it was like a few years after the Orange Revolution. Her fundamental base hasn't shifted. Her base base, like women, rural areas, I can't remember the age demographics, all things older women. Um, but if you look at that, why is that? They love her. <laughs> They're completely locked into her. But does she attract new voters? Very rarely. And the people that vote for her, like in the last election, when they looked like she would be against Poroshenko, remember? I don't remember many people saying, I'm really excited by what Yulia offers. It was just, I hate Petro Poroshenko, so I'll vote for Yulia. Or I hate Yulia, I'll vote for Petro Poroshenko. It was not because they liked either candidate. So there's like a third uh, factor in this equation as to how voters make their decision. It's lack of other, opportun other options in the market. Make sense? Okay. Anything else? Come on, guys, ask questions. No? Questions? Maybe we show this one example from the yeah, campaign with cancer. Sure. So here's an ad that we did on the campaign. That was, um, we have a guy, and this obviously, remember, there's 5,000 points of data, but this is showing you just four of them. So we see a guy who has, is a guy, he has a kid, he likes guns, but the reason he likes guns is not for self-defense, it's for hunting. So someone who buys guns for self-defense, the ad might be something like a hand getting broken in the window and saying you must be able to prepare, must be prepared to defend your family. But somebody who's got a kid and he likes hunting and he's not worried about self-defense, they might show something like this, because that appeals to him and why he likes guns. For every person in society, we'd have ads that were specified for them. Hundreds and hundreds of different ads at one time going throughout the population. And these ads, we knew were effective, by the way, because we tested it uh, in a lot of different ways to make sure that it was effectively guaranteeing new voters to us or donations, depending on the goal. 
And this ad was a normal one. Like the hunting ads especially were really good. Uh, because there's a lot of different reasons. Historically what happened to these voters? These voters who my biggest passion in life is hunting with my son and the tradition of our family of hunting. That is my passion in life, that's what I care about. And they would be receiving ads talking about the environment, schools, taxes. And they said, but I don't care about schools and taxes. I care about hunting with my son. And they're being ignored. That means if another campaign contacts them before we do, and he talks about this issue, he might be persuaded to vote for them. So our job was to show him a message explaining exactly how we were the campaign that were able to provide them with what they were looking for. Is there another slide? No. So, okay. I don't remember. Um, so all the ads were specified per person. What other questions are there, guys? I'll keep going, but, okay. What instruments do you use to segment the algorithm? <coughs> so why we had all those physicists was algorithms. Uh, they would just do algorithms. And we're creating all these things, and we'd look at things that they'd seek to find correlations. And sometimes there was correlations, and sometimes there wasn't. For instance, there was a correlation, a statistically significant correlation, between somebody's preference, or somebody's level of education, and income level, and voting Democrat or Republican. Statistically significant, right? So that's how we break that one. But what was not statistically significant was your Facebook data. So despite the fact the movie talks about Facebook a lot. The Facebook data that they had was never actually used by the campaign. And the reason, which is very strange to me too, but despite the fact they had everyone's Facebook data, that Facebook data doesn't actually give us a clear indication whom somebody's gonna vote for. It just shows us usually a lot of nonsense. It shows us things such as what they like to do on their weekends. And though you think that's, well, that's not that sort of data, Yes, but just when it's in an abstract, like this picture of you drinking beer with your friends, that doesn't really tell us much about you. That's very generic. When it says in your credit card history that you buy beer every single Friday, that's something we can numerize, put into numbers, and then put into a data set, and that data set can then be used to create calculations and algorithms, which then allows us to predict your other personality traits and abilities. It's, so, it's yeah. kind of close to that, credit card history. It's the same, yeah. So, I mean, we'd, we'd have to then classify it. So you would then have something for instance. You would numerize everything, all these different things, you put into a spreadsheet, and then you put numbers. And those numbers would then, you know, be something that we could put into an equation and try to understand what the, the relationship was. So, one of the statistics that we always used to use, we found that correlations that we couldn't, they don't help us in a campaign, but we're super interested, as an example. I think it was, we had with more than 95% Likelihood or, or, or uh, probability. What? probability? Probability, thank you. Probability, now we're 95% probability of predicting which women would get pregnant in the next nine months. We had more than 95% probability of predicting who's going to, or it's more than 98% of who's going to go bankrupt in the next year. We had more than 95%, uh, 94% of who'd lose their job in the next year. We had more than 90% of predicting who would, I think, it was get cancer in the next five years. It was a number of things like this that you would think like, well, with you with all this data, I predict a lot. Because though I don't know specifically what you do, I can just say that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of <laughs> men in America who smoke cigarettes that are this age, that drink alcohol this much and eat this much meat, and they live this sort of unhealthy lifestyle. And what do you know, by the time they reach 40, that percentage of where they got cancer. So if we can look at more specific details of where they live and what they drink and everything else, we say, well, now I have more than 90% probability of predicting who will get cancer and when. And they say, well, this is cancer they get when you're 50. Who is it that gets cancer when they're 30? What's well, very unusual. Most people that are 30 don't get cancer. But we see that young men who have this personality that do this sort of things, that have these sorts of purchases, that live this sort of lifestyle, are statistically much more likely to get cancer. We can then have a higher degree of predicting who they would be in the population. So if you wish to prevent cancer or you work for an insurance company and you wish to say, you should go to the doctor and get checked to make sure you're healthy, you should go to the doctor and make sure you're healthy, it has a great sociological or societal benefit and that you could then target the people, why show an advertisement to everybody about preventing cancer? Statistically, you're very unlikely to have it at your age. But there are those that do get cancer and they die because they don't go really get checked to the doctor. But if we could predict exactly who the 2% is in the population rather than the other 98% who it's just noise, it's more likely to be effective in persuading them to go to the doctor. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's how you would use it in the, like, the medical science field. <coughs> uh, any other questions so far? 
Oh, keep going. Oh, yeah. um, we started to talk about Facebook, uh, so I want to ask uh, nowadays, uh, some people tell that uh, their companies can be a treat for democracy uh, because they can shift election. And I saw such example like uh, that uh, Facebook can remind you in a day before election, but he only can remind uh, those people who vote for certain uh, parts like Democratic Party, right. Republican, Libertarian, or Green. Uh, is it true? And uh, we know that these companies are transnational, so uh, tweets which appear in uh, USA, they sooner or later can appear here. Right, that's a good question. Um, there, yes, if, if you were to manipulate this, it, I mean, the Chinese use big data too. And we see how that's worked for the Chinese, and ask the Uyghurs how their lives are on their big data. So it depends on what it's being applied as. But I think just generally, if we're looking at a general the United States model of how we use big data. It's not Orwellian. It's not 1984, the book. Um, it's less scary. Because though that could happen, the reality is because everybody uses it, there's a market now. It's not just like one person has control. All the major parties use this. We only have two. But <laughs> both the parties use it. And because both the parties have it, it allows them both to compete and compete and make the science better and better and better. And that's why one day when Ukraine finally starts using big data in a serious way, it'll allow for us to do incredible things here as well. Because the party that starts using this, instead of having some person stand in the street freezing, handing this thing out, his ability to get elected is much higher. I mean, the probability of getting, if you just target people, obviously much better. So one day it will come to Ukraine, it's a matter of when, but it's already being used here. To be clear, other parties here have tried to start using this. And also, it's used all the time, and you don't realize it. And I give an example all the time, which is in Ukraine special. Is when you go to the store here, everyone has these discount cards, and everyone signs up for the discount for their 1% discount or whatever it is. The reason they're giving you a discount card is two things. Client loyalty, which makes you more likely to go back to that store. If there's a pharmacy, why do you always go to this pharmacy, not the pharmacy? So you get the discount. But there's also a secondary factor. By collecting your data, they are able to predict things about you. So the example I always give, and it's really common in the US, and it's been this way for years and years and years and years. When you go to the pharmacy, anywhere in America, one of the major companies like CVS is a major American pharmacy. And they see what you're buying. And they can predict incredible things about you as a person based upon what you're buying. So if they see that you're always going to the pharmacy for, I don't know, diapers, for children, for babies, right? You're going there all the time to buy this. Like, let's have a child. But if you're buying two times more diapers than it's normal for a child, probably means you have two children. And that they see this. So when you flip over your receipt, on the back side there's advertisements in the US on receipts at the pharmacies. And the advertisements are specialized for you. It'll be children's toys. For somebody else who's an old person, and they're seeing you're always buying things for medicine for old people, the advertisement will be like the thing to walk, you know, whatever the hell is old people buy. It'll be things like this because they're not going to be buying toys. But they will be buying things to help them live as an old person. So the advertisements are specifically for old people. If you have, so this all makes sense, right? So that's how it's currently used in pharmacies. But if you look at it as another field, look at this. We have the entire population in the United States, which is a lot of people. And it's sort of crazy, so many people. But we have all these people running around. Not all people in the population are equally likely to do anything, whatever the decision is, whether it's to study, whether it's to become a terrorist, whether it's go to prison, whether it's to smoke or to drink. There are societal factors that we can break down. And the way that we can break it down is by having a massive data set. And by having this data set, it allows us to have a deeper understanding of how, who they are and what they're likely to do with their lives but also what is likely to influence them in lives. And that's why, for instance, it's not like a big secret, but when you have terrorist organizations, good example, terrorist organizations are in common. Here, Syria, there's not that many terrorists here. There's a limited number of people. The whole population doesn't need to be terrified. You don't have to scare terrorists. But let's imagine that you could say in the total population of Iraq, and that massive population of millions of people, you can break down the sociological attributes of someone's like being a terrorist. So that's just going to be these guys here. 
Typically, by the way, it's men between the ages of 15 and I think it's 29. We're likely to be terrorists, join a terrorist organization. So if we know that's who they are, what other attributes they have? Well, we know the level of education that's normal for terrorists and their families. We know that the level of uh, the income level that's normal for them. We know a number of different factors. There's a lot of data that's been talked about terrorists. Once we have this, we can have advertisements just for these people saying, don't be a terrorist. That's not good for you. And so what we do is you target them. And by the way, the US does do this because they talk about it. They target them. They have advertisements just for those people. And they receive SMSs and they receive things on the internet that says, you know, don't be a terrorist. We know that you're, don't consider this path. Here's a result in death. But then for their family, because this family also has a lot of pressure on these 15 to 24 year olds or 29 year olds, their family also receives messages. Their mother might receive messages saying, your son is at risk of becoming a terrorist. If he becomes a terrorist, we will come and prosecute you and your family as well. You'll also go to prison. So then she's telling him, what the hell are you doing? Stop it, stop it. And she's persuaded. So the father, we say, we're gonna put you in prison and your wife's gonna be left in the street hungry and starving. And the rest of your children are gonna starve because your son must become a terrorist. The societal pressure we could put on them to not be a terrorist is very high. But if we were to send this message to everybody in the country, it would create panic. It would create anarchy in the country. Because people would be like, why are they sending this to me? I would lose a terrorist in my family. It would terrify the population. But if we just target this group, which might be only a few thousand people in the entire country of millions and millions and tens of millions, it could be highly effective in decreasing the amount of terrorism within the country. So is that cool? Yes, it's very cool. <laughs> So terrorism, terrorism is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> Just say no to terrorism. Yeah. <laughs> so what else is that, Kitty? Uh, I am. Uh, okay, so could you please uh, tell more about the recruitment process by Cambridge Analytica and maybe your company? And, like, how did it actually turn out to be that 20 astrophysicists from the University of Cambridge and out there? And how did they kind of surpass the momentum editions, so maybe computer scientists and some other people? So Cambridge Analytica was part of a group called SEL. SEL was a political consultancy in the UK that worked in a lot of countries, mostly in Africa. Yep, mostly in Africa. And what happened was the guy, the founder of the company, decided that data science, it's funny, he went to a lecture with Tom and thought it was fascinating and started data science. Um, so. What he did was he began this firm. The firm, he was also a Cambridge graduate, by the way. But what the firm did was he started collecting data scientists, people that had an interest in this, people that had degrees in this. And they started having these circles, these meetings, where they hang out and discuss these things. And he understood that there was potential high value in this. Like, this could make a lot of money. And he was right. But what he did was he found investors. Based upon those investors, he could then pay people. Once he's able to pay a group of data scientists, start buying data. Lots and lots and lots and lots of data from the UK and from the US. Once he had accumulated all this data, he then began to sell it. So he would go to all the campaigns in the US and make his presentation. Look, we're offering data science. Do you know what it is? I'll explain it to you. And he'd explain it to them. And their sales, actually, to be fair to them, were really good. American people like British accents. So they were very impressed. And they came and they would give this very incredible polished, smart presentation with a PhD from Cambridge. And no matter what you, by the way, it was very funny. I remember I asked a question during the presentation. And I said, that doesn't really make sense. And I put it something out. And he said, it's science. Don't you believe in science? <laughs> and I was like, so, is that what should answer is that? I mean, because it doesn't answer the question, but it's like obvious, it's science. Um, so anyways, the, the thing is, they were then able to, due to their sales, and I seriously mean this, there are a ton of companies that do what Cambridge Analytica did, a ton. They have even more data than Cambridge Analytica had. But Cambridge became famous because their sales were so good. They were amazing at selling their product to people. And so they would go and they'd meet with you and everyone was so impressed, they sounded so intelligent, so articulate, they started winning all these contracts. And if you saw the movie, The Great Hack, whatever it was called, The Big Hack, you saw this, no, mm -hmm. yes, no? So, in the movie, there's that idiot with the colored hair, who's uh, Wiley, I think was his name. He's the guy who defected from Cambridge Analytica. He quit, by the way, in 2014. They didn't work in the US till 2015, so he has no idea what he's, he's making up. But either way, that's only here there. So Wiley was, but he doesn't mention, by the way, 
he approached the Trump campaign as well, and he said, you should hire me, I'm the best. And they said, we're considering hiring Cambridge Analytica. When they hired Cambridge and not him, is when he started attacking Cambridge Analytica publicly. Up until that point, he was selling himself as being able to reproduce Cambridge Analytica for the Trump campaign. Funny how the world works. Um, so why does Cambridge get all the negative press? They are major competition for all the other companies that do this. They were, they were destroying the market. I mean, they were just all the business. That was crazy, huh? So what else is there? Anything else? Для реализации технологии микротолетина от компании к компании. Время и существование, правильно? То есть от одной компании к другой. Было ли же твою практику опыт, когда ты работал с политиком и видел несколько моделей, то есть в разных исторических ну, периодах, в разное время, что в них меняется? Культурные ориентации э, или же установки, э, например, там, ну, внешне политические, э, оценки экономической ситуации. Есть ли такие изменения? Естественно, какие? Мне просто интересно. От компании к компании меняется что-то в этой модели, которую мы создаем ну, на основе разной группы данных для микротолетия? Ну, конечно, есть разница. Это было, что, есть. Надо понимать, что, что вопрос или каждый Нет, вид, это, это отвлекается от другого. То есть, например, то есть на президентские выборы в Америке я бы сказал, что из-за того, что это демократия, то есть Хиллари Клинтон против Трампа. Это свой вопрос, есть свой интерес. То есть это был вопрос иммиграции нелегальной. Это был вопрос, связанный с налогами национальными. Но на местном уровне совсем разные вопросы. То есть это уже какие-то дорожки строить или какие-то школы там находятся. Из этого все вопросы, о чем мы говорили, менялись, зависит на самые главные вопросы этих вибрах. А, ну, люди сами, знаешь, что интересно, что даже несмотря на то, что мы не знаем, что будет через два года, через год на вибрах, какие были самые актуальные вопросы в Америке. Но мы знаем все равно, что этот человек всегда против государства, как пример. Значит, если это будет вопрос дорог, о дорогах, то мы знаем, что он никогда не будет поддерживать, что будут еще дороги, которые государство строит. Он уже хочет какая-то частная, чтобы какая-то частная компания строила дороги. То есть мы можем понимать каждого человека и его общий взгляд на мир. Что он хочет? Что больше государства или меньше государства? И они любят эти дороги, потому что они любят, что он платит слишком много налогов. Из этого мы можем сказать, что вот смотри, да, наш конкурент хочет строить эти дороги. Мы тоже хотим строить дороги. Но разница в том, что мы не хотим убрать твои деньги, мы не хотим украсть еще твои налоги. Нет, так не сделано. Мы будем строить дороги. Но у нас есть свой план. И объяснить ему на уровне, который он бы понял этот вопрос. То есть меняется все всегда, я понял. Да. Another question? Despite this is kind of innovative instruments in political companies, is there any kind of professional ethics standardized and qualified? No? So <laughs> maybe some uh, movement in this direction. No really. No. <laughs> <laughs> Or I mean, just don't be like China. Uh, what about, uh, um, I don't know, uh, legal or illegal practices in this? Is there some re uh, regulation in legal? Practices? Every country has specific laws about legalities. I mean, every country is, of course, different. And for instance, like in the US, medical data is like a, a whole ton of laws. You cannot just like buy medical data. Like, it's really protected. And it's absurd. America is crazy about that. I don't know why. I mean, it's stupid laws. So for instance, if I were to call, if, if I am here now and I call my wife and I said, I need this prescription for the doctor. Can you call the doctor? They won't answer the phone. Well, they'll say, you know, we can't tell you. We can't tell you if he's a patient. She's like, but you know, my husband called. Can you tell me, like, where to get the prescription? We can't even tell you if he comes here. It's stupid. That's the way the U.S. is. So it is very protected data, medical data. But as far as everything else goes, completely not protected. Which is ironic because your data as going to the doctor is protected, but your data if you go to the pharmacist is not. So you can't buy the medicines. And based upon that, you can figure out what diseases he has. So what else is there? Uh, have you found 
found that maybe some factor is more relevant to uh, the selection of specific candidate than the other. For example, like people of uh, Latin heritage, they vote for uh, every candidate like some of them was for this candidate, some of them was for that candidate, but for example, like people with high education, they won't, like, they found that some factors relate more to the selection of candidate than another. Absolutely. No, I mean, the normal sociological thing, right, that's why we still do polling, is the normal sociological questions, like education level, mm -hmm. income level, uh, where do they live? age, sex, are the most likely to predict things in people. Like if you just have to look at like general principles, so like for instance, Latins in the United States, Hispanics, are less likely to vote Republican than to vote Democrat. However, if they are upper middle class, they're more likely to vote Republican. However, if they're upper upper class, they're more likely to vote Democrat. So there is like a cross sample of where it is, and it all depends where they are. If they're in the South, they're more likely to vote Republican. If they're in California or New York, they're more likely to vote Democrat. So it also depends on where they are in the country. And their age. The ones who are older have more traditional values. The more traditional values they have, the more likely they have to vote Republican. The more liberal their values, the more likely they are to vote uh, Democrat. So it does vary depending on a number of factors. But in general, yeah, I mean, the U.S., it's... The U.S. is sort of predictable, and that's what I'm saying. People, for instance, blacks in the last election, which is different, is Barack Obama. <laughs> you would not surprise that a majority of blacks would have Barack Obama, the first black president. But in the Donald Trump Hillary Clinton election, 93% voted Democrat. 93%. That's not even like similar. It's completely for one side. Um, there's a cultural norm to that. There's a cultural tradition of voting Democrat. Um, uneducated whites, much more likely to vote Republican. Hyper-educated whites, much more likely to vote Democrat. Wall Street, much more likely to vote Democrat. Anything else, guys? Yeah. Uh, how to get hired by a company on Cambridge Analytica? <laughs> uh, Cambridge Analytica went out of business, but we, um, the, comp the, the, the companies that remain, there's a lot of data science companies now, and there's a lot of them. And they're doing work in a lot of countries. I mean, there's, as I said, here in Ukraine, it exists. Trust me, it's there. You're just not aware of it. Um, and especially after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, I think it's less popular to talk about how campaigns use it. But the fact is, they all use it. And that's the absurdity of it. It's like in the United States, we started collecting this data in the 1970s. Since the 1970s, political campaigns in the US have been collecting data on it. And it was less less complex, obviously, 50 years ago. Who is literally like lives in the sort of a house, has two kids, has two cars, very simple things. But as time has progressed, it's collected more and more and more data. And simply, there is not a means to do this before. You needed computers to do this. I mean, you must do it with computers. It's just the quantity of data is so great. So in Ukraine, it's finally taking off here. So there are companies that hire for it. But as I said, the majority of the people that are in this field, the vast majority are the ones who are data scientists. Data scientists are mathematicians. That's like all the jobs. I was unusual in that I was not a mathematician. I was advising them on how to target American voters. So for instance, what that means is, as an example, let's say that we realize that Protestant Americans that are age 50 to 65 were living in Michigan, in this part of Michigan, were 10% less likely than they should be to vote for us. So we have to just to increase that votership because they should be voting for us, but for some reason they're not. So we write advertisements specific to them about you know Protestant values and Protestantism. But because we had well, mostly British people who aren't religious, they had no concept of how Protestants think or what's interesting for them. Or like how they would write something. And you have to be sort of from that culture, which I'm not a Protestant, but you have to be from that culture to understand how it works or how Michigan works or how people behave. So it's to advise them on not only the messaging of how to make it specific to that target demographic, but to also figure out what was politically relevant. Like they'd find a correlation showing that which women are likely to get pregnant in society. It's like, well, that's really interesting, but we don't really care. That doesn't really affect who they're going to vote for. Unless there's a correlation that shows they're likely to vote for us because of this or not because of this, then we might play with it. 
But if just because it's interesting, we can't use that, it'll say, no, it's useless data. Because they're mathematicians, they didn't have the perception of what we could use in politics that might be fruitful for us, and what was just, no, that's cool, that's nice. <laughs> so I was advising them that, which is a very rare job, because there's only like six people that work for Cambridge Analytica doing that, and they work for the other five campaigns Cambridge is on. I was the only one on the cruise campaign. <laughs> Anything else? Last question. Мы видим, что мегатаргетинг, конечно, создает прикол очень конкурентный, да, борьба за каждый голос, то есть конкуренция сильно возрастает. Но параллельно же можно сказать, что размывают идеологические позиции партии, то есть массовые популистские партии, да, которые нет какой-то определенной идеологичности. Какая компания будет в 2020 году в Соединенных Штатах, да? Как социальные исследования в мегатаргетинге, как исследования Big Data меняют политику вообще? Да, и как это расскажется на компании, в политике в целом? Ну, и... Есть какие-то вот, твои ощущения? Ну, я знаю, что есть у тебя. Но... Ну, потому что сейчас мы еще не знаем, какие темы будут самые актуальные через несколько месяцев. Я сейчас не работаю на компаниях в Америке, из этого я не знаю, что происходит там, как они думают, э, ну, где они считают самые актуальные темы. Но я бы ожидал, давай посмотрим, что будет теми связано на Украине, кстати. А, ну, кроме этого, а, в Америке это будет связано первым, я думаю, что это будет связано с иммиграцией, потому что иммиграция это как вечная тема в Америке. А, Федра, я думаю, что очень актуально сейчас, больше чем раньше еще, это гей rights, прав геев. А почему? Потому что сейчас уже есть прав а, злопра, а, сравнительство в браке, ну, на русском. То есть можно жениться два мужчины. Да, Есть уже все, можно. Тогда это уже закончилось, значит, что это уже не вопрос. Уже никто не спорится об этом. Но демократическая партия из-за своих праймериз да, сейчас решила, бог знает почему, но они решили, что свои позиции будут левее, чем республиканская. А что это значит? Что уже это не вопрос геев, это уже вопрос транссексуал, даже не знаю, что такое. Mm -hmm. Но это мужчина, который не значит женщина. Ну дальше. Но они сказали, что ты уже прав человек, а потом начинают вопрос внутри своей партии. А если это мальчик, ему 7 лет, и он думает, что он девочка, тогда можно сделать ему операцию. Ну и что сказали, что да, и другой нет. А кто будет платить за это? Государство или лично? И потом начинают спор внутри своей партии. Для них это катастрофа. Потому что обычный граждан в Америке считается какой-то катастрофой. Зачем мальчику делать операцию? Но для свой аудитории, который, ну, Считается, что это очень актуально, это горячая тема в Америке. Это вообще, это менял дискурс, это, это разговор в Америке, о чем мы говорим, что пока Трамп говорит о экономике, они говорят об этом. Вообще, это не настоящая тема, это не тема о том, что о том люди, люди говорят. А из этого, я думаю, что это будет связано с моралом. То есть это будет, это не морально. И республиканская партия будет против иммиграции из-за традиционной морали в нашей обществе. А демократическая партия будет против морали традиционной в наше общество и за миграцию. Я думаю, что это будет два самые актуальные темы. Anything else? Что еще? Okay, I think that's all. Thank you, Jason. It was very educative and very interesting. I hope, well, at least it was for me, I hope for everyone else. It was also like that. Thank you.